Hello friends, it is Grace and welcome back to another video on my channel. The video that I'm going to be doing today is a spoiler chat for Lord of Chaos book six in the Wheel of Time. And if you know, well, I guess if you're watching this you'll have read Lord of Chaos and so you know it's a sizable book. Um, I think that it's the longest in the series if I'm not mistaken. A few others come close but Pretty sure Lord of Chaos is the longest boy, and while I really liked this book, I did feel that. Um, I, I really felt the length while I was reading this. I'll start off by saying that I gave Lord of Chaos four stars. Um, I did really enjoy it. It hasn't been my favorite in the series. I believe that that would still be The Shadow Rising, but um, I did really enjoy it. There was a lot a lot a lot a lot of interesting plot lines happening so I do just want to discuss those because that is the purpose of this video is for me to get my thoughts out there to you spoiler thoughts of course and then I would love if you would comment and let me know what you think and so that we can have a chat so I also just want to preface this by saying that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that there are gonna be things that I either forget or just don't mention here because I made some notes on my thoughts but I don't want this video to be like an hour and a half long like, again let me know in the comments like if there's something that you want to hear my thoughts on or if you just want to tell me your thoughts and then we can have a chat about that um, because like I won't mention everything inevitably so I first off want to start with Elaine and Nynaeve's storyline because we get a lot from them in the first like half of this book we get a lot from them throughout the whole book but I did feel like the focus was quite heavily on them and their work in Saladar uh, near the start so I enjoyed their storyline. I really liked how we got to continue with them as like Elaine is working on the Tarangreels and Nynaeve is, well Nynaeve is working on them as well, but Nynaeve is also working on getting through her channeling block, which like as we know means that she can only channel when she gets angry and there's got to be a way to break through that block somehow. But I like uh, the fact that they're still kind of keeping Mogideon a secret. That's a big part of their storyline in this book is they need to come up with <laughs> ways to make discoveries that aren't suspicious because if like they know too much then people are going to start asking questions about the information that they know that like there's no way for them to know that because they're actually talking to one of the Forsaken um, and obviously they don't want people to know that Mogideon is there. Regardless of the way that Nynaeve and Elaine are getting their information, I find it super interesting that they are exploring more with the power and what they can do. Um, and Elaine seems really skilled in terms of making things, like she's almost like an engineer in the one power. Like she can look at that original ring that they had that would let them go into Teleron Riyadh and she can almost like reverse engineer it to recreate it, which I find really cool and the fact that Elaine was basically able to just recreate an eye dam um, to keep Mo Gideon captive and I like I'm really impressed with her so I like that she has her own kind of niche because Nynaeve is definitely still trying to figure out the healing thing and that's kind of her most important goal is if she can figure out how to heal Leanne and Swan that have been stilled so of course it comes to a head where it's very very important that Nynaeve actually does figure out how to do that which I was not like not that I wasn't expecting it but I felt like the pacing was really slow up until that point and then there was this one chapter that I was reading before bed and at the end of it Nynaeve successfully like heals Loghain and it was crazy like I was falling asleep but I was like oh my god like what like this is happening and I wanted to read another chapter but I knew that I couldn't I knew that I would fall asleep if I tried that because it was so late but like I was so caught off guard because I was like okay I like it to make I like to make it to chapter breaks before I stop reading so I was like okay you just need to get to the end of this chapter and then it's gonna be time for bed and then that happened right at the end of the chapter <laughs> that is obviously such an important discovery for Nynaeve because that changes 
the game. Like, the Saladar Aes Sedai are no longer, well, uh, given that she takes to teaching the Yellow about how to heal this, there is pretty much no danger of, like, a, a Saladar Aes Sedai losing their powers completely. Because we do see that when Nynaeve heals Swan, Swan is not as powerful in the One Power as she used to be. And I do wonder about the significance of that, because part of me thinks, like, maybe you can, like, maybe it's almost like tearing um, a, a ligament or something like that, like you can repair it, but your knee is never going to be the exact same as it was, even if it gets really healthy. Maybe it's like a muscle where you have to work it again. Like, I kind of disagree with myself on that because we do see that like people can be naturally very strong in the one power, and we see that with Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine. All of them were born very strong in the power, so I'm not sure if that would line up like with in-world possibilities, but I do see maybe a possibility for working back up, like practicing, like getting more skilled again for Swan, say. I don't know. I just hope that it's possible because that would be very significant. The other thing that I wanted to address in this book is that I actually found Nynaeve and Elaine, but mostly Nynaeve, more likable. Um, she started to grate on me a little bit in Fires of Heaven because like, I know that she is very stubborn and principled and wants to stick to her roots, but she like her internal monologue sometimes is very hypocritical. But I found that in this book, she was less aggressive maybe, like she wasn't so mean all the time or or angry and maybe that's a sign maybe maybe that's a sign of her shifting into like a better mental state to be able to break her block with the one power i'm not sure but i found it easier to to follow her character because like personally i find that she's still like keeping her principles she's not letting anybody bully her she's still great at standing up for herself she's still naive but she's also not so like aggressive and unreasonable, I guess. So it was a better balance for me personally, and like if Nynaeve follows along this path, I could see myself liking her a lot more because, you know, she's still a strong personality. I don't mind that she's a strong personality. It just grates on me like the way she could get hypocritical sometimes. The next person that I wanted to talk about because of the fact that it ties in with Elaine and Nynaeve is Egwene. So I thought that it was really interesting. I'm First of all, I'm glad that we came back to her in this book because I felt like for the past book or I can't remember exactly how long, but I felt like she took a little bit of a back seat. Like we didn't get into her perspective as much and get to like explore around as much. And I like the characters that we were focused on instead. So I'm not mad about that, but I did feel like I was watching a storyline over here and kind of thinking like, what's up with Egwene? Like we haven't really had anything for her for a while. So I really liked that we actually got to get back to her being like a truly main character feeling character. And another great thing about that was that she has definitely developed kind of off screen, but we've kind of seen it as well because we've come to understand more of Aiel culture and more about the Aiel wise ones. So it's not like we've seen this happen like totally off screen, totally out of the blue, but when we get back into Egwene's head, we can definitely see that she has developed as a character and her personal values have developed. And she has a really interesting combination of like her her values and principles from her childhood and those customs mixed with now some Aiel customs and I think that it makes her a really interesting she, she has a really interesting perspective because she can kind of like not pick and choose traditions because that sounds almost like disloyal or disrespectful but the, the additional perspective that she's been given allows her to kind of decide what she thinks is moral and what she thinks is right, and the Aiel have some really interesting ways of doing things. They place a big uh, emphasis on honor and what they believe to be honorable, and they seem like very, how do I put this, they seem like moral people for the most part. 
not necessarily the Shido, but for the most part. So I think it's really interesting the influences that Egwin appears to take from them. And so that obviously leads into the big thing for Egwene in this book, which I did not see coming at all, like her being named the Amerlin seat of the Saladar Aes Sedai. I think that I accidentally heard a spoiler at some point that Egwene was going to become the Amerlin seat at some point in the series, but I, like in my head, I guess, just assumed that that was going to happen way down the line. Like, when I started the series, I didn't know how compressed the timeline was going to be, because Egwene is still not even 20. I'm not sure exactly how old she is, but I guess I pictured her sitting the Emerlin seat when she was older, and like so that was something that she achieved. And it's not that, like... <laughs> It's not that she wouldn't be a good fit, because surprisingly, I think that she actually will be. But this obviously isn't something that she was expecting or like working towards within the group of Saladar Aes Sedai. It's like she just gets out of the, the world of dreams because that's how she has traveled to them. And she gets out of it and they're like marching her into a room and and naming her the Emerlin Seat. I was very caught off guard. but. Like I mentioned, Egwene has kind of added these new customs and perspectives to who she is as a person, and she already has a ton of backbone. And she's a very, like, self-assured person, or at least, even if she's unsure, she can project um, an air of confidence and competence. So, even though she's really young, it's an interestingly good choice, and I really like it. I like that that happened. And so I do have in my notes also, like, that she takes that mantle up impressively well. And I also like kind of the <laughs> the audacity, if you will. Like, she's just named Emerlin Seat, and it's obvious that the Aes Sedai are going to want to try and influence her, but she immediately just, like, raises Nynaeve and Elaine to be Aes Sedai, which, um... People are obviously not going to be expecting or necessarily happy about, but I love that Egwene is just like, well, you guys made me the Emerlin seat, so what, are you not going to let me do this? Like, I'm the one in charge here. Anyway, I really liked her throughout this book. Now, another thing, another big plus for me that I really liked um, leads me into the next storyline that I want to talk about for Lord of Chaos, which is Rand. And obviously Rand is the Dragon Reborn. Rand is like the central piece in the like literal wheel of time, like the pattern. And he is basically twisting chance around him. So he's literally the centerpiece. But I really liked how much we got to get back into his head in this book. We did get his perspective in Fires of Heaven. Like, we, we did, so I'm not complaining about that, but I liked how much of him we got in Lord of Chaos because I felt like it was more. And I might be imagining it just because of the distance between reading Fires of Heaven and reading Lord of Chaos, but I felt like we were in his head more in this book. And I really liked it because it's obvious from the outside that the people that have known Rand forever see him getting like colder, see him getting harder. They worry with good reason that he is going insane because that will happen to him eventually, inevitably, like it does to all men who know how to channel. But when you're inside of his head and you actually understand what his thought processes are at any given time, I find Rand so interesting. I really do enjoy following him and it's very impressive. Like, M Moraine was obviously a help with this as well, but it's very impressive to me how well he takes to politics and the game of houses and like all that sort of thing while also projecting an air of confidence and like he he's playing the politics, but sometimes he's not like sometimes he doesn't have patience for it. And he's just kind of like, no, like I'm the dragon reborn. You need to take my orders and do what I say. So it is very interesting. The main thing that captured me with this storyline was Rand's relations with um, Mazrim Tame or Time. I'm not actually sure how to say his name. Uh, I'll just call him Mazrim. <laughs> so Rand's relations with Mazrim and with the Aes Sedai just in general. And the reason for that is because Mazrim uh, freaks me out. Like, he creeps me out. I don't trust him at all. 
that guy. Like, I get why Rand did what he did, and I get that he would be a very good teacher to leave on this farm with the men that are coming to learn how to channel, and I understand why he wants to build that school the way he wants to build it, but... And, and I don't think that Rand really trusts him either, but I, the whole book, was worried, <laughs> and I still am worried. But we'll get to the ending more later. But I really do not trust an him, Mazarin, and the formation of the Black Tower with the Ashaman. I don't trust them. And maybe it's because they're not being taught by Rand. And you really don't know who these men are. Like, you, you don't know what they're like in principle, and you're training them in a very dangerous art. I guess the same can be said of Aes Sedai, but up until this point, the tower has had very stringent training for women that become Aes Sedai, whereas that's not going to be in place for men who join the Black Tower. So yeah, I think honestly, just on the whole, that aspect stressed me out. And then like I mentioned, the other relation that I was really interested in was Rand with the various factions of Aes Sedai. So of course, in Camlin, you have the Saladar Aes Sedai that have sent their embassy. You have Alana who binds him as his warder, her warder, sorry, against Rand's will. So that is a huge like, that's a huge portion of this book because Rand can then feel Alana in his head the whole time. And I, I liked the fact that even other Aes Sedai highlighted that what Alana did there was not nice. It's basically taking somebody against their will. And that, I think that just goes to show the seriousness of the bond between Aes Sedai and Warder and the actual seriousness of doing that to somebody against their own will. So I hope that that's explored more because that would be a very hard like offense to get over. That's that's some sort of assault. Like I don't know exactly what to equate it to, but that's a very offside thing to do by Alana. And so from there um, there's not a lot of trust in Rand for this faction of Aes Sedai that are in Camlin, especially when their numbers start to increase and get closer to 13. And so after her actions, Rand really has no reason to trust them either. So it's no surprise that the Aes Sedai that Min arrives with have trouble getting Rand into any sort of trusting conversation or open conversation like Rand has shut himself down and he it just repeats the mantra of like, you're not going to trust any Aes Sedai. And so the same applies to the tower Aes Sedai that come to Kyrian to try and like entreat with him from there. They were shadier from the start and not only because they have members of the Black Aja with them. But like that's a big reason for it <laughs> and I'm sure that plan that ends up getting carried out has to do with the presence of Black Sisters, but the tower is just not a nice place to be with Elida as the Amerlin seat. And I get this like feeling of foreboding surrounding the White Tower. I feel like the presence of the Black Aja inside the tower is a lot stronger now because of the rebels having left, and it's very, very alarming, let's say. So again, we will talk about the culmination of that storyline more when I talk about the ending of the book. But the other things that I liked about Rand's storyline were Min. Um, I really, I just really like Min. Um, so I did like that Min kind of goes there as somebody that Rand actually trusts. She can give him some emotional support, um, and Rand like maybe actually starts to see Min as a girl. Not that Min is exactly being subtle, but Rand is pretty dense when it comes to that. Like, Min's kissing him and he's like, oh, I wonder when she's gonna stop, like, kidding around, haha. <laughs> so, I mean, I found that funny. <laughs> I do like Min, and the whole thing with Min, Avienda, and Elaine is... <laughs> I have mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I'm like, of course, the... The male protagonist in this fantasy series has three women, three beautiful women, three amazingly strong characters in love with him, like blah blah blah, but then at the same time, <laughs> like I kind of just roll my eyes, you know, but I like who Min, Elaine, and Avienda are, and I like that, that they have relationships with each other and that they are all 
they genuinely are all like wonderful women character and I love them as characters so I like that they also are like actually doing their best to have a relationship and to deal with this and not to just be like fighting with each other there's two sides to that coin but I really I, I don't mind it on the whole like that storyline and then the last thing I wanted to mention that I really like about Rand's storyline is his psychological battle with Luz Theron Telamon so I think that like well obviously for Rand himself he hears this voice in his head and he doesn't know whether it's truly there or whether this is just some like echo of the past like he he knows that it actually is Luz Theron's voice but he doesn't know whether Luz Theron is actually there or whether this is just some sort of like psychosis and I do enjoy throughout the book Rand's struggle to basically beat back this voice in his head but then you start to see throughout the book that like it seems like Luz Theron is actually there and there are times that it seems like he's actually speaking back to Rand so I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing more of that and seeing like what form <laughs> Luz Theron actually takes in Rand's head like is he I think he is actually there, but how is he actually there? And I wonder if that's going to be explained. Okay, so I think this video is getting pretty long because I do tend to talk a lot when I have a lot to say about things like this, but I just have a couple more quick notes before I get into the ending of the book. So first of all, with Perrin and Fayil, um, I love Perrin. I do hate the jealousy storyline. Like, I'm starting to come around on Fayil a little bit more, um, but I, I've never been somebody that likes either an infidelity storyline or a jealousy storyline. Perrin, I love Perrin, and Fayil should know that Berylain, or however you say her name, he doesn't care about her and she's doing this on purpose to get Fayil angry and I just don't understand, like, I don't understand the complete cold shoulder, that's not going to solve anything. So anyway, I, I don't want to go on about that, but I don't love a jealousy storyline. That's just never been who I am as a reader. Um, and then we also have more gays. So I like that she is still kind of planning and trying to figure out a way to like get back to Camlin and take back her her rightful place but it, it does annoy me not annoy me it frustrates me that people don't know she's alive and I know that like she's she probably has a measure of safety because people don't know that she's alive but like when Gawain wants to basically kill Rand I'm like no but your mom's alive and like I want to tell Elaine too because I don't want Elaine to be grieving for her mother who's actually been alive all this time and I know that that has some great potential for like reunions and some triumphant returns which I do hope happen like genuinely because I like more gays but that's why it frustrates me <laughs> because um I know that Rand as the Dragon Reborn is gonna have people thinking that he is this cold monster but he didn't kill more gays, damn it. <laughs> okay, so finally, let's talk about the ending of this book. And I want to talk first about Rand sending Matt and his band of men to Saladar to bring Elaine back to Camlin. But Matt and his band of men, or at least a few of them, end up going with Elaine and Nynaeve to Ibu Dar. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. But they go to Ibu Dar and they kind of consort with Tylan, the queen of the city, and they are looking for a bowl, a terangreal that can fix the weather because the weather is a huge problem across the entire continent. So at the end of the book, they honestly, I'm having a brain fart right now, they haven't found the bowl, they're in Ibu Dar and that's where we leave Elaine and Nynaeve. And so that is kind of the culmination of their storyline for now. And then we have the big thing, which of course is the fact that Rand is kidnapped from Kyrian by the like, Aes Sedai from the tower. And so they have a very clever plan. They actually bring in like 13 Aes Sedai or however many it was that they brought to overpower Rand, stuff him in a box, and literally kidnap him. And 
that this was very smart of them because they know that Rand kind of just travels, like travel with a capital T, and that people won't necessarily miss him if they think that this is something that he does often, like he just goes off by himself and he'll come back, but then he doesn't come back. So Perrin then leads the pursuit for Rand and they are catching up to the Aes Sedai who have him. And then you have that big final battle when they finally catch up to him. And honestly, it's chaos because the Shido have their own plans for Rand and Savannah has her own plans for him. So the Shido have betrayed the Aes Sedai that were carrying Rand, but you also have Perrin's force coming in and fighting to try and free Rand. And honestly, like this battle was very eventful but very chaotic and so eventually you have Mazarim and the Ashaman maybe they're not all Ashaman because I think that that's a title that you get when you get those pins that Rand had distributed but regardless men who can channel they travel to the site of this battle and they turn the tide of the battle and they basically kill the Shido and like the battle is, is, is over when, when they get there, but it's very alarming and scary what they actually do because when they're killing the Shido, like the Aeol bodies are like exploding. So it, like Mazrum has taught these men to use some very dangerous weapons as weaves. And I get that like Rand can probably do that too, but seeing a fighting force that can actually do that, like they could turn, they could, turn on anyone and it is terrifying so that kind of goes back to the part where I don't trust them and I am scared that something bad is gonna happen there but at the end of the book you have the Saladar Aes Sedai basically being offered the choice where they can be kept captive with the Tower Aes Sedai or they can kneel to Rand and so they take the choice to kneel to Rand and become dragon sworn and so that's obviously a very significant event because Assuming that they hold enough sway, then Saladar is going to become sworn to the Dragon Reborn going forward. So on the whole, I wasn't surprised that that happened. I did think that Saladar was going to end up sworn to Rand in some way, but I was surprised by the way that it happened, and it was a little bit gruesome, that battle. So there's a lot that happened in this book, but again, it was so long. There's so much packed in here. I, of course, have not mentioned even close to everything. But for some reason, I was ex expecting this book to end with more of a bang than that. Maybe it's because you got Nynaeve learning how to heal Stilling, you got Egwene being like raised to Amberlin Seat, and then you have that big battle and the Aes Sedai kneeling to Rand. And those are three huge significant events, but they happen, they're kind of staggered. So it's not like you get an avalanche of events at the very end of the book. Just get them a little bit, um, spread out a little bit more in the second half of the book so you know a lot still happened here and we moved on like we moved the plot along so I did really enjoy it um, again I, I'm pretty sure I said this at the start of the video but I did give this book four stars and it is it's a very good book I don't I was thinking about how I would rank it in terms of the six books that I've read but I don't really want to think about that right now it was just really good and I did really enjoy it so I do believe that I have been talking for long enough but once again, um, if you have a comment, if you have thoughts that you would like to talk about regarding Lord of Chaos, um, please drop in the comments, let me know, talk to me. No spoilers past Lord of Chaos though, please, because this is my first read through of the series, so um, I don't want to read anything about like Crown of Swords and onwards, but yes, please do come talk to me. So like if you liked this video, subscribe if you want to see more content from me, and I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye!